Okay. <coughs> All right. Can I take this off here? Yeah. So, uh, this is going to be a nutshell version of a period of time during which uh, the Articles of Confederation existed before we actually put together the Constitution. And uh, <clears throat> it starts around the end of, uh, it actually begins right after the Declaration of Independence. And I'll, I'll go into that in a moment here. And it'll end about 1790 or so. These days I know that uh, most of the history being taught in the schools is, comes out in fifth grade. And I think I, I remember going through something about the Federalist Papers maybe in junior high. And then it was like 30 years later going through college that I got a, a number of, of history classes. But this particular period of time, usually what you hear is, yeah, we had this Articles of Confederation and they didn't work, so we, we built the Constitution. And that was it. And if we leave it at that, then I'm done talking. But there's, there's more to it. It's a pretty good drama. It has a little subterfuge, has some romance, and it has some guys doing their stuff, and it's everything that you need to have today to make a good TV show. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into a little bit of that. And it's going to take probably, I'm going to try to get it done in, in half an hour if I can. If I stick to my notes, it will be within the half hour limit, and if I deviate from them, eh, maybe a little more, I don't know. So. When did we become a nation? And this is a rhetorical question. You know, you can ask yourself, was it at the signing of the Declaration of Independence? Was it uh, Bunker Hill, Lexington and Concord? Just, just think about it a moment. When did we actually become a nation? Was it when Betsy Ross made a flag? You know, it's a rhetorical thing and you can think about it. We'll come back to this later in the program. And the reason I say that is because as you look at this, this is the final paragraph to the uh, Declaration of Independence. And what they have here is they mention free and independent states. Not once, but free and independent states. Not twice, but down here, uh, independent states made of right do. You know, three times in the final paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, our forefathers talked about free and independent states. And I say that because nobody, nobody during the revolutionary time period thought we were going to have a nation at the conclusion of the war. And that's, that's something that uh, people don't think about that. People just think that they signed the Declaration of Independence, we had a new nation. That's not necessarily the case because the people back then certainly didn't think that. They thought of themselves as New Yorkers or Virginians. And the reason for that was because we've been fighting, fighting the crown. And what the saying was, as it goes now, before 1776, before the Declaration, the only thing holding us together as a nation, or as a collection of states, was our resistance to the crown, or our, our being under the crown, and after that it was our resistance to it. So, once the, the war was won, everybody expected themselves to go off and be their own little nation states capable of conducting commerce with France and Spain and everybody else. And to put this in context, it took three weeks to get a letter from Boston down to Philadelphia. I don't know if you guys you can see that or not, but uh, yeah, yeah. That. you can go ahead and go down, go down through there. So, it, as you can see here, 30 miles is about the size of, what, a small county, a, a large township or so. Everybody lived, not everybody, you know, you had, the soldiers got out outside of their perimeter. They actually got outside this 30 mile thing as they marched off to do things. But a lot of them, like my ancestor, you know, he was in Ulster County in, in New York, and that's exactly where he stayed for the entire duration of the war, as a militia. And uh, I say that because 
This is what people saw, this is what they dealt with, and this is where, where they wanted to be. So right after the, the Declaration of Independence was written, they put together a 12-man committee led by this guy here, John Dickinson, to write these Articles of Confederation, which essentially is kind of like uh, the League of Nations document, tying little nations together for a common cause. They wanted to do this because the Europeans wouldn't look at us as being a country, you know, unless we, we appeared to give a united front. And immediately what happened was they found out as soon as they, they did this, and I say that because you notice uh, we're talking the 2nd and 3rd and 4th of July here up to the 22nd. Two weeks later they started this. They first came out with a, a problem with slavery. Same problem they had when they wrote the Declaration with slavery. And, and now it was again too. And then there was a problem with, you had states like Virginia and Pennsylvania were claiming everything out to the west. And then you got states along the east coast that are locked in because to the west of them is another state. And they're, they're like Maryland and, and places like that that are very small. And they want to have equal representation with the large states. So they proposed that every state get one vote, okay? 13 colonies, each one gets one vote. And about that time, the Brits come in and overrun New York, you know? So these guys get pushed out of Philadelphia because it's too close, and they go, they go running, running in under the inland. So then they thought, well, before we start putting together a government, maybe we ought to concentrate on the war, you know? But a little bit of effort did go into this. this. So this is kind of like a, what I was talking about with the expansion of the states, this is, I can't read it from here, but Virginia's right here. You see, this is the, the, the Mississippi River. So they're claiming everything out to the west. In order to be a member of the Confederation, they had to forego these claims to their western boundaries to appease the small states up in here, like Delaware and Maryland and whatnot. And, and they did. They actually did do this when they did finally ratify the Constitution. Here, Pennsylvania had claims, North and South Carolina. Everybody was claiming lands out, out to the West. <clears throat> Important thing that came up with the, uh, with the Confederation is that they had to have nine states together in the, in the Congress, with two people each, to have a quorum. Without the quorum, they couldn't decide anything. They couldn't make any motions on anything else. So, that's, I think this is pretty much what I put in there. Now, everything that they wrote into the Confederation was, you're gonna have the ability to tax the states to pay for the, the army that's in the field fighting the Brits right now. You're gonna have the ability to conduct um, foreign di diplomacy and stuff. And then there was always a clause put in there. And here's an example from Thomas Burke of South Carolina, which said, the states maintain their own sovereignty and they can do whatever they want. And so that would negate everything else they said in the Confederation. Consequently, you, you couldn't get much done with it as a, as a Confederation. So as we label them now, we had Continental Congresses during the war. We had the Confederation Congress, <coughs> from about 1779 to 1786 or so. And then you had a Constitutional Congress in 1787 <coughs> and 88 and 89. But your, your average Confederation Congress had 55 delegates. And I bring this up because this is kind of an important thing when you start writing the Constitution. 35 of these guys were Army officers. So they knew deprivation. They knew how to starve. They knew what it was like not having any funds provided to keep the troops alive. And you also had in here, this is important, 25 of the 55, or about 40% of them, were slaveholders, including George Washington, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson. All the Virginians had slaves. All right, so in 17... Most of the states ratified the Articles of Confederation in 1777. 
Two states did not ratify it or join it until 1781. It took Maryland and I think uh, Virginia to get all the way out there, uh, or maybe it was Rhode Island, I don't remember. Two of them didn't get, get into it for four years. When they did, they finally had all 13 states in the, in the Confederation. They went out and they assigned this guy to be the financier. America had no money, we had no credit. They would go overseas, they talked to Spain, they talked to France, they're like, we, you know, it was never a, we will give you this a tit for tat thing, it was always just give us, give us, give us. I was pleading with them because we had no credit, anything to give them. And I'm not gonna go into his bio, but uh, he, he was born in, in England, he came to the US as a very young man. He got involved with, at the very young age of 13 with a, a merchant guy as an apprentice, and 10 years later he was made a partner in the company. And then when his partner took off, he tripled the size of the fleet once, he became the richest man in Pennsylvania. He had a huge fleet of merchant ships, and he had great credit overseas. So when America was going over and asking for things, and they send this guy over to represent us, the people at the other end were doing business with him, not necessarily with America, but they didn't realize that. He was representing America when he did it. He was a man uh, who had credit. He, he understood credit, and he would do these things where he would write IOUs. They're known as Morris Notes. Robert Morris, he'd write these IOUs out. And he could give them to a foreign guy, and the foreign guy could take them to any one of his merchants and either redeem them for whatever he had on it. It could be merchandise, or it could be money. So he understood this thing. He understood that there, there were gaps in time between transactions where you received money and merchandise went out, and this and that and the other thing. And uh, when, when, they, when they asked him to become the finance minister for the, the Confederation, you know, he was all excited about it. It's like, okay, we need to have a national bank. We need to have taxation of all the states so we can gather funds. We've got to pay off our war debts. He went on and on and on with it, you know. And he was very soon disillusioned because uh, none of that could come to pass because nobody wanted to, to work with it. And that brings up the next guy I want to talk about, Alexander Hamilton. So Alexander Hamilton is one of these guys who was not born here. He was born down in the Caribbean. But he came here at a young age, you know. He, he's very outgoing. He wanted to go to one college, I can't remember which one, uh, I think Witherspoon was the president of it. And then uh, they wouldn't let him in because he said, I want to do the college in one year. And they're like, you can't do it in a year. We're not going to take you for that. So he went to King's College and he did it in a year. Um, he wrote essays and stuff at an early age and had him published. And by the time he came here to the Confederation Congress, he's 27 years old. He's the most outgoing, audacious person in the place. He started sending Morris letters. And he, he sent Robert Morris a note. And he said, here's what you need to do. You need to have a national bank of three million. You need to, you know, collect taxes from all the states to pay off our debts. You need to establish credit overseas. You need to have a merchant in this needs. He laid all this stuff out, and Morris is looking at him like, how can a guy half my age know all this stuff that I'm thinking right now? So he started mentoring Hamilton on the finance part. So that takes us up to about 1783. At which time, as we're closing in on the, uh, as we're closing in on the, the close of the war. Now keep in mind here, What's going on in 1781? You got Yorktown, right? You know, what, what happened, the first thing that happened was Robert Morris went in to the, the Congress and he said, send out a notice to all the states that, that they need to pay their taxes. I want $3 million. And uh, Congress, was, they sent it out. Well, Morris got 39000 back. That was it. Then he said, okay, I want to start a national tax where we tax everybody a small token for something, to bring something in. And, and it, it didn't pass by one vote, you know. And he said, well, if I, if I need to, I won't even pay the army. Well, you, you know, what? Nathaniel Green gets wind of this, and he's like, hey. And he describes a thousand starving soldiers to him. And Morris is like, okay. He writes out a Morris note. He pays to feed a thousand soldiers in national, Nathaniel Green's army, you know. Then the next thing that happens is he gets a letter in and it's, it's Washington and he's saying, 
I have an opportunity here to track the British in Yorktown. Problem is, I don't have any transportation to get from here to Yorktown. Robert Morris writes out another note and finances their, their passage down to Yorktown. You know, so that was going on already. 1783, Yorktown has come and gone. What happened was the Brits retreated to New York where they sat for two years, about 20,000 of them. Washington kept thinking they were going to appear on the coast somewhere, so he maintained a standing army of about 10,000 guys. And we're not really sure how this came about, but what happened was, in the spring of 1783, a letter came out of that army. It was signed by 13 generals, and it was sent to Congress. And it said, we haven't been paid in a year. And you promised us pensions, and we aren't sure that we're going to get the pensions. And oh, by the way, we're hungry, and we need, we need clothing. And the troops are disgruntled, and I don't know if we're going to be able to hold back a mutiny. All right, so Congress gets this. Hamilton scribbles off a note to George Washington, who's hanging out at, at Mount Vernon. He says, hey, you need to come get hold of the army. You know? So a couple weeks later, George Washington comes down. He calls all the officers out of the army, about 500 of them. They get into a big hall, and he gives them a passionate speech. And he says, this is a new nation, or a new, you know, a thing. We, we've done what we set up to do and everything. And I don't want you guys to ruin it by, by this bickering and stuff that you got going on. Then he had a letter from Congress that he was going to read to him, which was promising, you know, stuff to him. And so he just starts doing one of these trombone things. And then he pulls the glasses out of his pocket and he puts them on. And he, he makes a comment. He says, I have not only gone gray in the service of my country, I've also gone blind in it. And then he begins to read the, the letter, you know. And to which all the senior officers start bawling and crying and everything. They go and they give him a hug after which is the painting you got over here on the right. That's not the end of the story of the Newburgh crisis, though. What happens about two or three months later is, you know, somewhere up in Newburgh, you got 300 GIs, and they're standing there with their Morris notes. I didn't, I didn't get to this point. So Morris, at this point, is just fed up with being a finance minister. He can't get anything done. You know, he created a bank. He can't do a national currency. He can't collect any taxes from the states. He can't help the soldiers. He can't do anything with this. And so he says, I'm done with it, you know? And he spends his last two months in office writing more notes to every one of the soldiers in Washington's army, right? And uh, he's paying them out of pocket three months pay, wages. That's all he can afford, you know? 10,000 times three months wages. So, uh, Took me off track for just a moment there. Um, anyway, so 300 soldiers up in Newburgh, they're standing with their Morris notes and they're not happy with them. They go marching into Philadelphia. And getting into Philadelphia, of course, they're greeted by Tom's folks who are, oh, we got, we got soldiers here. Yeah, hey, you have a beer, you know? And the next thing you know, you got 300 drunk soldiers hanging up out in Philadelphia. And they get to the, they get to the, the, con the congressional building, and they start walking around and leering into the windows. And they're all carrying muskets and pointing, you know, and stuff like this. So the, the congressmen are a little disconcerted by this, you know. H Hamilton's sitting there, and he's like, he scratches out a quick note, and he's like, to the governor of Pennsylvania, and he says, you need to get the militia out here and clean this up. And he gives it to a courier, and he writes across Philadelphia to give it to the governor. And so pretty quick, the courier's coming back, and He's got, Hamilton picks up the note from the governor and says, if I send the militia, they're going to join him. He's like, mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> so, Congress picks up and they move out of Philadelphia. I think they went to Princeton. So, but all this stuff subsided. 1783 passed. Um, the army was disbanded. And, and, and life went on. So, you got to realize that uh, the other thing going on in 1783 I want to talk about is the Paris Peace Accord. So everybody in the U.S. is living in this red area over here. The British actually claim everything that's in pink over here over the coast. So this is what they were they were claiming, and everything to the west of that at the time was Spanish. All right. So you get to you get to the, the Paris 
and you got this delegation that's sitting there. Now you had you had John Jay, or John Jay was the one guy who was actually doing it. Ben Franklin was there, and he's laid up with gout. Um, Thomas Jefferson was supposed to be there, but his wife had just died, so he, he you know, begged off of it. Henry Lawrence of South Carolina, his replacement, got napped by the British on the way over to Paris. So he ends up in the Tower of London. He had uh, John Adams, who's bouncing around the Netherlands trying to gather loans. Right? So the only two that were actually in sight of Paris for the Paris Peace Treaty is John Jay and Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin, being in bed all the time, is not really a participant in the backroom politics that are going on with it. So John Jay's the guy doing it. What happens is, as he goes in and he's talking to a Spaniard one day, the Spaniard just arbitrarily takes his thumb on a map and he draws a line right down here like this. And he says, everything to the east will be yours, and everything to the west shall belong to Spain. You know, and it's like, John Jay's looking at it, and he was like, why? You know, what have you done for us? It's one of these things. Now, Congress had told Jay and Franklin, you cannot do any negotiations without telling the French who are allied with the Spanish, everything that's going on. So Jay came back into Franklin and he's like, we gotta, we, we gotta break the rules. I can't deal with the Spanish, I can't deal with the French, we need to negotiate directly with the Brits. And he said, two non-negotiables. We have our independence, and we have everything to the Mississippi. And that's exactly what he got out, out of the Paris Peace Treaty. To a point that, at a celebratory dinner in Paris for the negotiation of the definitive treaty, a French delegate proposed to toast to the growing greatness of America. Now poised to become the greatest empire in the world, the British negotiating team, they seconded the toast, you know. Then they added with a wink, and they'll speak in English, every one of them, you know. Because they were always vying with the French and everything over, over the continent. And then the funny part is, Everyone thought that America won a lopsided victory, you know. Gaining land that was larger than England, France, and Spain put together. When Benjamin West, the American-born artist and the favorite of George III, accepted a commission to paint the negotiators of peace, the entire British delegation refused to show up. They were fearful of being memorialized as the losers of Britain's North American colonies. <laughs> So, that's how the, Spanish, that's how the uh, Paris Peace Treaty came about. So I was talking about John Jay, and here's our love interest on here. I wouldn't have put her in here except that everything refers to her as the, and I quote, famously beautiful. Well, no, there's actually a painting out there on her. So we have a picture of Sarah Livingston, who was Sarah Jay. He was, she was the sister to John Livingston. Um, so Jay's a pretty extra, extraordinary guy. He's supposed to be a calm center of everything that's going on. He has a very good grasp of what he's doing. Um, he was the president of the Continental Congress for a number of months. Um, he grew up in a pretty good family. Um, he, he, he attended King's College, which is Columbia, if you, if you didn't know. So in, as 1784 rolls around, they appoint John Jay as, as Secretary of State. He's supposed to go out, this is from the Confederation, Articles Confederation, in, in Congress, they say, hey, we need somebody to go negotiate with these other countries. And oh, by the way, the Brits have moved back into the Great Lakes. They're occupying Dearborn, uh, Detroit, you know, Mitchell Mackinac up in the Mackinac Straits, et cetera, et cetera. And, it, and it's like, they're not supposed to do that according to the treaty. Well, the Brits are turning around and they're saying, but you guys aren't abiding by the treaty. Well, the treaty says you can't, you can't take old Tory homes and then confiscate them and sell them at, at, at cost, you know. And what was happening was New York was going, they were taking, labeling every Tory and then scarfing up his farm and then putting it on the market to sell to create revenue. So, you know, John Jay, he's like telling the states, hey, you got to abide by the, the treaty. And they're like, yeah, okay, we don't have to because we're, you know, whatever that clause was. We're our own independent states, you know. So he, he quickly got disillusioned with this. So by 1784, Robert Morris is no longer <coughs> the 
finance minister. We didn't really have one at that point. Um, John Jay was the Secretary of State. He's kind of disillusioned with this stuff. Um, Thomas Jefferson did make a, a claim in there at one point that if you had a chunk of land about 100 meters to 150 square, 100 to 150 square miles, you should be able to make a state out of it once you had 20,000 people in it. That seems like incredibly small to me. That would be like a county, I think, but I don't know. That's, that's the way he had it, and that would kind of set the basis for things that were going on. Now, James Madison, who I haven't talked about yet, and he's, he ends up in 1774 and 75 submitting requests to the Congress to redo the Articles of Confederation. People are having problems with it. There's a lot of turmoil with it, you know. And, and they don't get it done. So the next thing that happens is 1786. What happens is by this point, you got New York is putting tariffs on goods coming in from North Carolina. And you got Pennsylvania putting tariffs on goods from New York. So the states are beginning to put tariffs on the goods that they're trading with each other, you know? And they said, we need to have a Congress set up to go, this year at the Congress, we're gonna discuss the tariff problem. They meet, they meet in Philadelphia, they don't have a quorum. They can't decide anything. <coughs> as they're getting up, as, as they're getting up to leave, Matt, uh, Hamilton, you know, remember Madison has submitted these things and they keep getting shot down or they'll redo the, the Confederation. Two years in a row he's done this. Hamilton just gets up and he walks up and he says, next year we're meeting at this time, at this place, and we're going to discuss redoing the Articles of Confederation. Period. And everybody's like shuffling their papers and they're like nodding in, the, in agreement, you know. So that's how it ended in 1786. But before they did this, we have another uprising we have to go over. And this is a little farmer up in Massachusetts called Daniel Shea. So Massachusetts, prior to this, had started going through this thing where they were going to try to pay off some of their war debts and they were going to tax everybody. And you got Daniel Shea is a, a, an old soldier who has a little farm. He's a poor farmer. And he gathers up a group of people, and, they, and this went on for a number of months, you know. They, it's like six or seven months. They go in and they rough up a town, or they get upset and they tear things up. They might riot like you see going on on TV these days. <coughs> it culminated when they got to the armory. So in, in March of 1770, 1787, they go in and they try taking over an armory in Massachusetts, and the governor calls out the militia and they have a standoff, and that puts down the Shays' Rebellion. But, by the time this stuff reaches the Congress, you, you know how it works today in the news, right? You're talking maybe, it could have 300 people at one time, it may have, they say 2,000 overall, I don't think you ever saw 2,000 together, but by the time it reaches the Congress, the word they get is 20 to 40,000 Massachusetts guys are trying to overthrow the government, okay? And that's without mass media. This is like runners coming in. So they're kind of, they're like, so when Hamilton says, we're going to redo the Articles of Confederation, they're like, okay, got it, you know, we will. And that, that's kind of how that came about to be. Okay, so finally we get to this part here. So George Washington hasn't played in the Articles at all. He's a member of the Virginia delegation, but he loves living on Mount Vernon where he's got, he actually had like 300 slaves, you know. It was a plantation of huge size. I can't, like, you're talking like 1,500 acres or something? I don't know. 8,000 acres. Was it 8,000? I just saw it on a thing this morning. Okay, I was going to say. He said all his five farms, I think, was 8,000 acres. Okay, thanks, Richard. I knew it was huge. It's, I couldn't, I, I saw it and I was like, okay, whatever. Anyway, um, so, he doesn't, he's in a position, and if, like I said, stuff, things have been written about these guys, there are volumes on all of them. Washington went into, he created this organization known as the Cincinnatus, which is like retired army officers. And he wanted to stay in his role as a Cincinnatus, okay? And, and yet, he he's has this lingering interest. There's still something out there. He has a big ego. And there's something out there that he, want, he has an interest in how this comes out with the Confederation versus the statehood versus national stuff, you know. And so what happens is Madison, Jay, and Hamilton 
are writing a note. We call this the courtship of George Washington. And uh, finally, Hamilton sends him a note, and he says, you need to get down here to the Congress because posterity is watching what you do, and your legacy is going to be dependent on the outcome. George Washington grabs three slaves, one of them being Billy Ray and Loppy Heads, to Philadelphia to sit in you know, the Congress. As soon as he gets there, Robert Morris, the financier from earlier, he nominates George Washington to be president of the Congress. Everybody agrees, and George Washington gets the high back chair where he sits every day. And Billy Ray is standing right behind him, attending to his every need. So, 1787, the Congress shows up in Philadelphia. Bad weather prevents a few people from coming on time. Madison gets there early. He's been preparing. Madison wants to do, uh, he wants to do, well, let me start with this. He's born off to a good family. He goes to the King's College, I think. He, uh, he's very analytical. He does everything very meticulous. He, can, he prepares for all court meetings and everything else. He's been preparing for this. He thinks we need to be a, a state. I mean, a nation, you know, as opposed to a state. He is a Virginian. He's an eloquent speaker, and he has, he has that business going in his favor. He gets there early. He talks to the other people that got there early. He's doing the behind the scenes politicking. We need to be a nation. We need to be a nation. Yeah, we need to be a nation. You can't be a Virginian anymore. We need to be a nation. He's going around doing this with, with everybody that's there. Two of the people that are there are these guys. This guy over here, and there's multiple pictures I could have used for this. His first name is Governor. This is another Morris. We had Robert Morris, the financier, and we have Governor Morris from New York. He's right here. He's got a peg leg. He's a very charismatic guy. He gets up and speaks more often at the Constitutional Convention than anybody else. And he delivered some very haranguing speeches about slavery, which Madison never did, you know. Neither did Hamilton. Hamilton was so anti-slavery, he knew, and he so abrasive that he knew if he got up there, the entire South would walk out, we'd never have a nation. We'd never have a constitution. So, when they met in 1787 to discuss, and this is a Constitutional Congress now, to discuss not redoing the Articles, but replacing the Articles, which is what they exactly did. Um, they had two elephants in the room. Dead on arrival was, we need an executive power. First thing they said, we, you know, the president concept. No, 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 we've been fighting the king. We don't want another king. We're not going to elect a king. So it took some convincing to get that on into the, the Constitution itself. And the second thing, again, was slavery. You had 25 of the guys that were, were slaveholders, you know. What they decided after a period of time was that uh, for, for representation, they would allow a slave to represent three-fifths of a person. And then they agreed that they would not stop slavery until the year 1787. Thomas Jefferson had already put in agreement when he was talking about the states that they would stop slavery by the year 1800. But the South didn't agree with it. They didn't, so they, they, they shot down the, the proposal. <coughs> Governor uh, Morris here he said, here's what we got going on, you know. James Adams had, back in 1760s, or 1770s, he had submitted an essay out there that everybody kind of followed, and it talked about an executive power, a legislative branch, and a judiciary as being part of what a government should have. And most of the 13 colonies were doing that. So Governor Morris got up and proposed, he's, he's a New Yorker, that they follow the Virginia plan, which is a 15-point plan, which talked about those exact things, where you had a bicameral legislature. And that's what they voted on and unanimously agreed on, is what they would put into the document that they were writing. Madison had two non-negotiables during this time period. 
He said he wanted equal representation by population in the legislature. And uh, what was the second one? I don't remember. What was, do I have it up there? No, I, I probably skipped the slide here. This is what John Dickinson said about the three fifths thing. He wasn't happy with it. Like, can you guys read that? Or let me read it to you. Okay, yeah. Now, Madison, he wanted, he wanted a represent, representation based on population, and he also wanted a federal veto of state things, whether they write laws that aren't correct or whatever. He wanted the feds to be able to veto that. In the end, he didn't get either one of those. All right. And what I will add in here is uh, Ben Franklin was president of all these things, too. He's 81, and he's suffering from kidney stones and gout. Periodically, as they're sitting here, everybody liked Ben Franklin. He's a very, you know, funny, congenial guy. But at this age, he's like, he wasn't always tracking with what they're talking about. He would throw out some off-topic thing, and they would all, they would all honor him by, you know, going along with it for a bit, and then they'd slowly allow it to die. They would never vote on it or anything. And then, you know, he'd sit there quietly for a period of time, and then maybe do it again, you know. But he, he was there, he was a signatory on this came up with during these discussions about the Constitution and the legislature was that we have two houses in the legislature. You got the House of Representatives, which is based on population, and you have the Senate, which is based on, this is a one state has one vote concept. Each state gets two senators, so they all have equal representation. So that's, that's known as the Great Compromise at this time period. At the end of 1787, is that fall, they completed the Constitution. They had it written. Now you got to realize that in all the United States, there was one room in Philadelphia that knew what the hell they were doing. Nobody else had even, even had a win of this. They, uh, they had made an agreement when they went into this that they were not going to talk about it outside of the building, and that's the way it stayed. We, don't, we had no idea what Billy Ray, the slaves standing behind Washington, thought as they were arguing about slavery right in front of them. You know, we have no idea what Washington thought about Billy Ray standing there and listening to it because nobody wrote anything down about this stuff. But what they did realize was we are we're taking all of America and we're going to create something new for it. The people need to have a voice in this. So what they do is they take the Constitution, they send it out to the 13 colonies and they say, talk about it and let us know what you want to do. And so all 13 colonies take it, they send it down to the municipalities, they publish it in the paper. And then all the people go home and they talk about it in the pubs, at home, and every place else. And at some time in the not too distant future, the state legislatures get together and they begin debating the merits of being a nation or remaining a nation state as the state of Virginia or Maryland or whatever. This is known as the Great Debate. And before I get into that, I want to talk about the syntax here, because this is coming up. You have the nationalists, or those people that think we need to be a nation. And you have the confederationists, who are people that think we need to be states of a nation. And uh, what happened, and this is largely due to Hamilton and his Federalist Papers, he labels the nationalists Federalists. And then as he's writing the papers, he ref refers to the opposition as being anti-federalist. Okay, what, I know this doesn't make any sense. I, I will give you an example. Ten years ago, we had a global war on terror. And, and it financed everything going on in the Mideast. It was g watt, g watt dollars were going everywhere across the government. And we got a new president. And, and g watt was outlawed. We couldn't say it anymore. All of a sudden, we were in a persistent era of conflict. And, and it's syntax. People are dying just like they were yesterday in the Middle East, but we're not in a war anymore. It's just an era of persistent conflict. See, and this is a this is a syntax thing to soften the blow to those out there that are willing to to listen to it. This business here, anytime you say you say nationalist and confederationist, 
this sounds pretty good. When you go down and you say Federalist, then you say anything anti, you're automatically putting the people off of anti thing. That makes them look at the anti guys as maybe being something bad. And that's exactly what Hamilton wanted to do. Because he's a nationalist, he wants to turn the opposition away. But I put that in here just as a matter of syntax, because from now on we're going to be talking about Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Next one being uh, of the states to ratify all this. There were three that actually had uh, interesting times. Maryland. Maryland, you know, it's like they kept debating it, debating it, debating it. Finally, George Washington sitting in Mount Vernon, he's like, I mean, Congress was out, he was back home. <coughs> Waiting on the returns to come in, he's like, he sent him a note. And the note said, you guys need to vote, you know? And they, they, they get it in Maryland, it's kind of funny. It's like, oh, the general's telling us to vote. Okay, let's take a vote. And they end up passing it over well you know? We got Maryland. They had to have nine states ratify the Constitution in order to be a nation, or in order for it to be in effect for everybody. They had two states they had a problem with, Virginia and New York. These are the two big states, and, and they really need to have them in there. So what happens is early on, in 17, starting in 1787, uh, Hamilton attacks this guy here, Governor Clinton. Is that who we got up here? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what what happens is uh, this guy's an anti-federalist. So John Jay is from New York, and this guy said, "You're not going to be a delegate from us because you are a federalist. I I want to remain a state, not part of that nation." And since I want to remain a state, I'm not going to send you down there to vote your conscience on this. So John Jay was not a delegate from New York while this guy was in here. And then he came along and he said, uh, well, that was Patrick Henry who did that. Part. We'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, as this was going along, they got into some more stuff. So as part of this great debate, is the time period they're talking about it, where all, all the villages, all the towns, all the states, are discussing the viability of having a constitution to make us a nation, a group of one. What happens is, Hamilton goes out and writes Federalist papers. He just didn't write one or two of them. I don't know, he looks a little foggy to me, but down here you can see he wrote like 52, uh, Madison 29, and John Jay wrote like five or so. All those Federalist Papers were targeted at New York. Not for the whole U.S., just at New York. It's a propaganda going into New York. They published them under the name Plumius here. And so any, anybody that, that countered, this, countered this in New York had the right to Plumius. So in, in his Federalist Papers, he referred to the Anti-Federalist, right? So people are reading that. And then those guys had to respond to Plumius. At the same time, or right after this, actually, after this business is going on, you have a great debate going on in Virginia. And finally, the Virginians take it to the legislature, and they're debating it there, where you have the great Patrick Henry, who's the great orator of the age, and who's he up against? James Madison, who just got done writing 29 papers, so he's pretty well beefed up on what this government's supposed to look like. Well, this is the roll-up of how all this stuff was supposed to supposed to look. And my eyes aren't good. I don't know how well this is tuned in. You can see in the beginning here, in December of 1787, four states ratified this almost universally. And by the time you get down in here, where guys are asking for amendments, um, it's not quite that way. As a matter of fact, New York only passed it by three votes. So, and the other thing is, you know, these, these bottom two things are like, uh, who's the bottom one down here? Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Yeah, 1790. You're talking almost two and a half years after, after they actually wrote the Constitution, right? By a, a vote of 34 to 32. That tells you right off that these states were not that excited about becoming part of a nation, okay? You notice over here this part which says, with amendments? A lot of the states wanted 
amendments added to this thing, and they wanted to make their acceptance of it conditional on these amendments being added. Now Washington and Madison came out and told them flat out, no, you got to accept it as written, in total. And uh, they, they did, so all these votes are based on the Constitution the way it is. They submitted, the states submitted a total of 124 amendments. Almost all of them were restricting the powers of the federal government. Okay, they were very afraid of, of the feds. I mean, they just got done fighting the feds in, in the name of the crown. But here they're, they're afraid of it. And some of them were so resistant to it, like that Governor Clinton, he submitted 40 amendments, you know, that he wanted put in there. So, but the bottom line is, everybody did ratify the Constitution. They had a Constitution. We had a state. Governor Morris was the one who wrote most of the Constitution. And he's also the peg leg guy. And he's also the one that, you know, they say that he authored the preamble. The preamble originally read, we the people of the state of Virginia, the state of Pennsylvania, the state of New York, the state of whatever, and he, he like, did the old red line right through it and he said, we the people of the United States, you know. And, and he, like I said, they, they say that he had a bigger hand in it than Madison did. Madison was the impetus to, to push it all along and everything. Once you have a constitution, what have you got to do? You got to elect the president. So this is where we get into our first election tampering. So, not say that, but I mean, this is the way it came out. The way the, ele the, the president was elected in the day, the delegates would just vote. You vote for the guy you want to be president. And the guy with the highest votes becomes president, right? And the second highest votes becomes VP. Well, everybody in New England wanted, guess who? John Adams, right? right. And, and Hamilton's like, we can't have this, you know? It's like, the it's interesting thing about Hamilton was being born in the Caribbean, he was not a Virginian, not a New Yorker or anything. So he had no state ties or anything. He just was looking at people. Now, the only person suitable for this, in my book, would be George Washington. So Hamilton goes to the New England delegates, and he says, are you voting for Adams? You know, the guy would say, yeah. And he's like, well, I want you to take a look at Carter over there. He's got some good qualities and everything. And he tries getting the, the guys who are voting for Adams to throw their vote over to a third person so that there would be fewer votes for Adams and the same number of votes for Washington. <clears throat> so in the end, George Washington got 69 votes, John Adams got 34, and, and if you had included Hamilton's play in there, it could have gone 10 votes either way, but Washington was still the, the, the winner. He became president, Adams still <coughs> becomes VP. One more thing to do, the Bill of Rights. And Madison took this to heart and chopped all those 124 amendments down to 17, which went to 12, and then the Senate cut it to 10. And then it became a matter of where do we put it? Why did he do that? Madison actually took a turnabout. He came out and said, initially, he said, I I'm not in favor of amendments. I'm not in favor of a Bill of Rights. It's, it's, it's ridiculous to put a list of rights in a paper. We may leave some out. We may forget some. We may not be able to uphold them. You know? It's like, I, I don't want to do that. And... But then he had a turnaround because his competition, Patrick Henry, was trying to get another Congress together and he was certain they were doing it to overthrow the Constitution. So he said, okay, well I have to appease them, I will do the Bill of Rights. And he did, he did it pretty much basically straight off of his own writing. 